Hello, everybody. I am so happy that you chose to join us again. Uh, let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come to say thank you. Thank you for bringing us together again, even though we are virtual. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to study your word. We ask, as always, that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your fresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, once again, thank you all for joining us again. We are still on article number 11, The Perseverance of Saints. And our author writes, We believe that such only are real believers as endure unto the end that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. If you recall, uh, we have ventured out from our main scripture of John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32. And we are currently on what I call the scenic route uh, to take a fresh look at how much the Father loves the whole world and even those who do not love him. There are lots of uh, verses in the Bible that uh, affirms this fact, but we've chosen one that is very familiar to most of us. Uh, John 3.16, most of, most of us can, can recite that, John 3.16. Uh, rather than jumping right into the verse, uh, we have chosen to slowly walk our way into it, starting with verse 1. And, and so uh, if you've been with us, we, you know that we've made our way down to verse 10. And then when, while we were studying verse 10, uh, a question that had been in the back of my mind just kind of burst out without warning. And, and the question was, why a Pharisee? Why would Jesus choose a Pharisee to give the whole plan of salvation in a nutshell? Why would God choose the most arrogant, self-centered, hypocritical of that era to receive something that would impact the whole world. Now, to the people of that day, the Pharisees were an impressive group. Um, I, I was in my studying, uh, one commentary stated that they came about around BC 175, which is 175 years before Christ. Uh, they came about after a surreal. Syria, uh, Syrian, I get it, king, tried to stamp out the Jewish religion. And they wanted to replace it with Greek customs and practices. And, and so in opposition of this threat, a number of Jewish men set themselves apart to save the Jewish religion. And, and so they refused to practice the Greek customs and they refused to dedicate themselves to practice. Uh, well, they refused to practice the Greek customs and they chose to dedicate themselves to practicing the Jewish law in the strictest of sense. They were like uh, rigid with it. They felt that by carrying out every little detail of the law and, and then they could teach others to do the same. And in doing that, they could prevent the Jewish nation. Uh, they could preserve the Jewish nation and prevent their religion from dying out. So they were organized in the beginning solely for preserving the law and the Jewish religion. They came to consider themselves the savior of the Jewish nation, which makes it easy to see how over the years they would have come, uh, become in their minds partners with God. That happens a lot in, in our churches, uh, especially 
churches that are well established or churches that have been been around for a long time. Because usually what happens is a group or some groups that may have started with good intentions, uh, but over the years, they have become strongholds within the church. And, and, and these groups, this stronghold prevents any kind of progress. Uh, most times, it, it is such a stronghold that those groups must die out before the church can grow spiritually. So over the years, the scribes had expanded the Jewish law and they had tacked on uh, thousands of little rules and regulations that they called the oral or spoken rules. And so these little tack-ons or add-ons had, had taken on the same, if, if not more, sacredness as the law itself. Uh, these little rules had become so important that they were practically doing away with the law, the actual law of God, and, and putting more emphasis on these laws, these little relig uh, traditions that they come up with. The Pharisees were a body of the most zealous religionists. They, they had intense seriousness, intense dedication, intense passion, and, and, and they were zealous. They were self-denying, and, and they were moral and supposedly upstanding. They were also self-righteous. They were heartless. And they were hypocritical. They never had a sense or a need for repentance, nor did they see themselves as sinners. The Pharisees were not, uh, they were not an overly large group of people uh, because not many people would subject themselves to such strictness and, and the demands that the Pharisees put on themselves. I would imagine that one of the reasons they were held in such high regard by the people uh, was because of their strictness and, and the demands that they put on themselves. You know, most of us don't have that type of discipline that would cause us to deny ourselves too many of the world's pleasures. We're just not going to do it. It's like being an Olympian. We admire them, but very few of us are willing to do what it takes to be one. The Pharisees were an elite group of men that belonged to an elite group that just anybody could not join. Jesus, in fact, would not have been included uh, in, in their list of friends. He, he would not have been the BFF. You know, they wouldn't be like, hashtag, we love Jesus. No. And, and, and the thing is, he didn't desire to join them. And can you imagine a ministry in the church where Jesus is not only not invited, but he has no desire to join? In fact, to the Pharisees, Jesus was public enemy number one. Jesus was not a graduate of one of their religious schools. And, and, and then on top of all that, he attacked their rules and their regulations. And, and so that they had added to God's law. He wasn't impressed with their traditions. They were constantly looking for ways to arrest him, constantly looking for ways to kill him. And despite all that, Jesus chose Nicodemus, a Pharisee, to tell of the great love the Father has for the whole world. It appears that this scene with Jesus and Nicodemus is only found in the Gospel of John. 
And John is specific when he speaks of Nicodemus. He says there was a man. And, and then he tells us that that man was a Pharisee. And he tells us that the Pharisee's name was Nicodemus. And that he was a member of the Jewish ruling council. All specific stuff. Which brings me back to my question. Why a Pharisee? That question caused me to take a closer look at the Pharisees and, and that interacted with Jesus. Last time, we took a look at their self-righteousness or more uh, specific, their, uh, we, we took a look at their righteousness and more specific, their self-righteousness. And, and so Jesus taught in Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 20, that he, he told the people that unless their righteousness exceeded that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they would certainly not enter the kingdom of God. And then John the Baptist, when he came on the scene, he was preaching, his message was that everybody, all needed to repent. And, and so much like our day, the people of, of, of that day looked at certain groups, and, and you know how we do that. We think of certain people. We put labels on certain folk as being obvious sinners. You know, the folk that you just can't help but to say, hey, they must be sinners. The Pharisees couldn't see their need for repentance, and, and they refused to be categorized with publicans, a.k.a. tax collectors. It's like the, the, the tax collectors and the sinners were two groups that the Pharisees like, we don't have anything to do with them. To the self-righteous Pharisees, Jesus said in Matthew 21, 32, he says, I tell you the truth, tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. The Pharisees refused to believe John's message, and they refused to repent of their sin. Why? Because they thought they were sinless. Thus, they thought they had no, no need for repentance. You would think that when they saw what repentance did for the publicans and the sinners, you would think they would have a, a light bulb moment and believe, that, and believe that John's message was true and their salvation was real. <clears throat> a rejection of John was actually a rejection of the Father. Who sent him? But God uh, is gracious, and, and 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 instead of sending judgment on them, He sent His Son with mercy. <laughs> Jesus told a parable in the Gospel of Luke that was aimed at some who was confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. He, he said. Two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. He said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I, I'm not a robber or evildoers or adulterers. And even this tax collector, I fast twice a week. And give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. But beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, the Pharisee, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. 
So over and over, Jesus brought to light the self-righteousness and unbelief of the Pharisees. The sad thing is that the Pharisees were completely in the dark. And they thought, no matter what Jesus said, they thought they were right and Jesus was wrong. Their chief concern was to keep their own traditions. To them, their traditions were more important than God's commands. One day, some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of elders by not washing their hands before they eat? Jesus responded by turning their question around by asking them, why do you break the commands of God for the sake of your tradition? Then Jesus proceeded to give them an example of how they did exactly that. And so to drive the point home, I'll read Mark, the seventh chapter, uh, starting with verse one. And this is the NIV. It said, excuse me, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, you, you hypocrites at his written. The, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the command of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is Corbin, that is a gift devoted to God. Then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like this. So, as verse 11 stated, Corbin is a gift devoted to God. Now, if you look at, at it at its face value, you would think, what's so bad about that? Why wouldn't Jesus approve of it? Corbin was a consecrated present to the temple fund or, or the temple treasury. So, Corbin was, was a treasure that was uh, in the contribution box that stood in, in the in you know in the offering uh, in the offering room. Remember, uh, just to give you an idea of how hypocritical they were. Remember back when Judas hung himself, uh, they had given him thirty pieces of silver out of the temple fund. And, and and he brought it back uh, and threw it on the, in the temple floor. And these upstanding religious leaders wouldn't accept the money back into the temple treasure, which was, they said, it, you know, this was money set aside for as a gift to God. So they wouldn't give it, wouldn't take it back, even though they took it out of the treasure. And so they were careful to observe the law 
even while at the same time they were guilty of breaking the law, which was the whole point of this whole discussion with the Pharisees. So what they did was they decided we will use the money to do good uh, and purchase a, a potter's field where Jewish strangers who died could be buried properly. So in their mind, they were doing something good with the money that they had taken out of the treasure to pay Judas to turn Jesus over. Note the hypocrisy of all of that, which is Jesus' point. So Corbin, which was a gift offered to God, uh, and, 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 and like us, the Jews were known for making rash vows. You know how we go, we're talking to somebody, say, I swear, uh, uh, I'm going to do this, you know, or you promise you're going to do a thing. And no one, not giving it thoughts. And, and then it's like, you can't do it. You know, that's a rash vow. So the Jews, for example, if the parents needed financial support, they would just declare the funds that they would have given to the parents as Corbin. And the rabbis who took the money, knowing the hardships of the parent, would uphold the vow. Instead of saying, no, you need to use this money to take care of your parents, they accepted the money. And, and so the question could be asked, why did Jesus bring this up? But remember what was happening. The Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus to talk about the disciples eating and not washing their hands. The washing of their hands was this big ritual. It, it was a big performance to show how pious and righteous they were. That wasn't a commandment from God. That was a tradition of the elders. And I should point out, <clears throat> that the Pharisees and the scribes, they came to Jesus in the first place to find faults to criticize. They were looking for something. They, they weren't com concerned about hygiene. They weren't concerned about the, the disciples' hygiene before they, were eat, before they ate. They were just coming to him trying to establish some kind of religious ground that Something, some rule, religious rule that he had broken. Remember in verse three, uh, it, it says the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of elder. So they went through this big ritual of washing their hands so that everybody could see how righteous they were. So their question to Jesus was, why aren't your disciples holding to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Jesus knew that they were a bunch of hypocrites. And to expose them as such, he brought up the Corbin issue. These religious Pharisees and scribes were complaining about the disciples breaking their man-made religious rules but they themselves were blatantly rejecting and even canceling God's infallible rule. And they didn't, it didn't bother them one bit. And in fact, they permitted the people offering the Corbin to also break the rules. And instead of telling them, no, you need to take care of your parents, they took the money. And then said, you don't have to do anything for your parents. So what, what should not have angered them did anger them. And what should have angered them didn't bother them. And instead of instructing the Jews in the ways of God, they gave precedence to commandments of men. They made what men say traditions that have been passed on by the elders more important than what God said. Tradition of men that outright contradicted God's word. One of the things that's always bothered me about this whole thing is what did the religious folk get out of the whole thing? You know, because they're, they're offering the money as a gift 
to God. Now, y'all, I admit I'm slow sometimes, even when it when the answer is staring me in the face. But it was because the religious leaders enjoyed the gifts that was presented to the temple. They could take the wealth for themselves. <clears throat> Forget the needy parents of the person offering the gift. Thus, Jesus made the statement in verse 6. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own tradition. This was just a, it's just one of many examples given by Jesus that makes it easy to see why he labeled them hypocrites. Hey y'all, this year, especially, uh, you know, as the election fired up, uh, and this year, it seems uh, more so than any other year, at least in my life. And maybe I'm just was paying attention this year. But we have seen the hypocrisy play out in the political and the religious arena. Just enormous this year. The, the, the hypocritical things that have happened uh, in, in this year. But due to lack of time, I'll just mention one such a thing that has really been kind of gnawing at my mind. Just won't leave me alone. It is why it's like, why do seemingly religious folk, quote religious folk, find it appalling to vote for a Democrat? You know, they say, well, we can't vote for a Democrat because the Democrats believe in abortions, which is not necessarily correct. But these same religious folk are not appalled by babies being snatched from their mothers at the border. And now over 500 babies and children may be permanently separated from their mothers. How can one be wrong and the other be okay? Kind of sounds hypocritical. And that's all I got to say about that. And that's all I have for today. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Until next time, be safe and come back and join us next week. Love you guys. Bye-bye.